Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fantasy Labs 2024 team preview of the New York Football Giants. Inside, you're going to find three interesting things about the squad. We'll get into the offensive philosophy, what the betting markets are saying, the deep sleeper to potentially target in your drafts, the position battle that needs to be monitored, beat writers to follow, who we think the Giants would be if they were a TV or a movie character, all that and so much more. So give us 30 minutes. We'll get you fully acquainted with the New York Giants. And I'm Ian Harditz, and joining me, as always, to help me accomplish this very goal, none other than Fantasy Life Director of Analytics and all-around baller, Dwayne The Rock McFarlane. And Dwayne, we are talking about a team that, let's face it, hasn't had too many good years in recent history. Now, two Super Bowls since 2007, so I'm not going to be crying a river for this fan base or anything like that, but especially in the post-Eli Manning, just hasn't been all that good. That said, there is some reason for optimism, specifically because of a certain first-round pick. There's a new star wide receiver in town, and his name is Malik Neighbors. So it was excruciating to go through the draft process and just hear almost Neighbors just catch, you know, so many strays because people were just appalled that anyone could be compared to Marvin Harrison Jr. But what I don't think everyone realizes, Dwayne, is that if we could just put Marv aside and focus on Neighbors, my God, we're looking at an incredible wide receiver prospect here. Yeah, absolutely. And we have this thing over at Fantasy Life called the supermodel. And for wide receivers, what we do is we go back and we take the things that have shown to be the most predictive for future success, leaving college, coming to the NFL. And then we put all those things into one metric. And you guys can check it out and see all the prospects back to 2018 and one database. And when you look at Malik Neighbors, he owns the third highest score in the supermodel sandwiched between Jamar Chase and Jalen Waddle, obviously, he is also below number one, another rookie, which we'll say for another show that, that we'll talk about. But we have two really good rookies this year. And I do think it's because when you talk about a guy like Marvin Harrison, people have heard about him so long that they're just expecting Marvin Harrison. There's so much buildup behind it. And then you say a name like Malik Neighbors, which, which might have been a little bit newer to some people coming into this offseason. It's easy. I see why people might be like, oh, why are people saying this? But when you really go back and look at the data points for neighbors, he belongs in the same tier as Marvin Harrison Jr. And that's what the model came out telling us. I mean, this guy, Ian, didn't matter if he was playing against man coverage, zone coverage. He had a 30% target rate against man, 25% against zone. Those are both wide receiver one worthy numbers. This is a guy that can do a lot after the catch. He can beat you every single area of the field. You want him to win underneath on a gimmicky play, can do it. You want him to win intermediate on a slant route and just take it to the house, he can do that as well. Didn't get a ton of deep passing, and at LSU, but definitely shows to have the archetype that he could be able to do that more in an NFL style offense. So when I look at Malik Neighbors, like I just I absolutely love him, Ian. I think he's a he's a mid-range wide receiver too, right out of the gate. You know, I mean, maybe he finishes more as a low-end wide receiver too, but would he would it surprise me even if he challenged for a low-end wide receiver one? Not saying that's likely, but it wouldn't surprise me if he was a low-end wide receiver one this year. Not a lot of target competition right now in New York. I know we'll talk about the quarterback in a minute, but before we kill the buzz, <laughs> what are your thoughts on neighbors? Well, again, you brought up a lot of good points why I think he could battle for that, you know, wide receiver one spot in all of fantasy, you know, sooner rather than later. Because again, if we're just trying to evaluate wide receivers, the talent, yeah, it's there. No one had more receptions of 20 plus yards last season. 30 forced missed tackles. I mean, echoing everything you said, man, whether it's just, you know, jet sweeps, the top passes, or hey, here's, you know, run a double move and get wide open deep. Neighbors was killing defenses with every square inch of the field. And I think he can do that at the NFL as well. Talent there the workload looks pretty great your fantasy projections have him tabbed for 131 targets in year one that's the 14th highest mark of any wide receiver the target competition darren waller retired to go do weird music videos and elsewhere yeah wandale robinson darius slayton jalen hyatt not really moving the needle the question Dwayne, is can daniel jones or drew Locke actually get him the football enough to produce the fantasy points and honestly 
I love the comps that the supermodel gave because I see neighbors first season looking an awful lot like Jalen Waddle's first season where, okay, that was pre Tyree kill. So we saw Waddle really getting force fed the football, but he wasn't creating as many explosive plays as we were used to seeing. It was a lifeless, you know, pre Mike McDaniel dolphins offense where Tua just wasn't quite getting it done yet, but in full PPR Waddle were certainly capable of booming anyway. So Waddle, we somehow got to buy as like a wide receiver four. that still doesn't make sense to me. You know, all, all these years later don't quite have that same luxury with Malik neighbors but man Dwayne like you're looking at it as much as the quarterback is a problem I do still think Brian Dable is a pretty smart guy and you look at the first two years of the Stefan Dix experience in Buffalo 166 164 targets I mean would it surprise you at all if Malik neighbors is breezing past 150 targets this year it wouldn't surprise me um because again like we have seen Dable show an ability to center his offense around someone in a passing game. So I think it really all comes down to neighbors. Like how quickly does he acclimate to the offense? We know that sometimes you can struggle, even if you're really good making that transition from college to the NFL, you got to be on the same page with the quarterback. You got to both be reading man coverage or zone coverage at the same time. Quarterbacks have to trust you. We have no doubt that this guy can make plays, but if he can build that trust with Daniel Jones, I think that can go a long way or whether that ends up being Drew Locke. I'm sure you're going to have something to say about that a little bit later, Mr. Harditz. We know your love for Drew Locke. Um, it doesn't really matter to me. Either one of those guys, I think that there's an opportunity for Malik neighbors, neighbor, neighbors to climb into that wide receiver one conversation. But I think it's safe to project him, like I said, mid-range to low-end wide receiver two. Everything that he does from there, like you just consider it upside. Could it be a wide receiver three? Yeah, that's also in the cards. Uh, I've got a great article that'll be coming out. Well, I say it's great. You guys can tell me if it's great. It'll be coming <laughs> out later this week. And it really went back and I just looked at when wide receivers are in their prime. And a lot of it was around the older guys that we have. We have so many really elite wide receivers heading into age 31, 32 seasons. But I also looked at what has that historically meant for the rookies and the early career guys. And look, the really good wide receivers, like they're giving you 80 to 85% of their prime year production as rookies and second year players now. So do we think Malik Neighbors is going to come out and be the best version of, his, of himself in year one? No, but that could still be a really good wide receiver two season. Checking out my exposure right now and tied for my fourth fourth most drafted wide receiver oh, and nice. 60 underdog drafts, Malik Neighbors himself. So again, there's a downside. I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys that Daniel Jones is this incredible NFL quarterback. But again, once you get past the first 10 or so wide receivers, one of those four categories I was talking about usually does bring up the red flag. A lot of guys around Neighbors is more so the target competition we're worried about. Hey, when we're getting you know, 30, 40 more targets in some of these guys, guess what? A couple of them can be you know airmailed over their heads and it won't matter all what percentage much. are you at that's amazing 23 oh man i thought i was i'm at 15 percent, which is like way above the field and i thought <laughs> i was aggressive that's really good man because um, his, his price has been coming up over, over the last you know week or so yeah. so hopefully you got some of that uh late round three neighbors Yes, sir. One, a man can dream. A man can dream, Twain. All right. Second most likely fantasy relevant player in this offense is new RB1, Devin Singletary. And again, similar to kind of our conversation on Ezekiel Elliott, Twain, just if you look at the raw touch projection relative to where he's being drafted, still someone that's going, you know, in round nine, even round 10 sometimes, it does seem like Singletary does have a path to upside in fantasy land. Now, I know people want to make him out to be this dead zone archetype running back in. I can understand that. If you you're looking at this Giants offensive line, again, not being good, them not having much scoring upside. He does profile someone that you're more or less just drafting for the touches. But man, that type of player was going round three, round four a couple years ago. Again, not round nine, round 10. So again, three years, 16 and a half million, got 9.5 million in guaranteed money. That's more than what Derrick Henry got with the Ravens. He's reuniting with his former Bills offensive coordinator in Brian Dable. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say Singletary is, you know, the world's greatest running back, Dwayne, but I do think he gets overlooked. And if you want to go ahead and just compare literally – PFF rushing grade, yards per carry, yards, you know, after contact per carry, missed tackles force, explosive run play rate. He's better career than Saquon is. So, no, I'm not taking him over Saquon. But if we have 80% of Saquon with the same amount of touches, that's a pretty good fantasy player. Yeah, I think the biggest difference is he's never been a plus in the passing game. You know, and that's and right. that that's that's the differentiator at running back. Like more than efficiency. Like if you know you got a player that could get the volume, the question is, can they be good in the passing game? If they, if they can, that's the cheat code. That that's where you get somebody that can really stand out. Um, so 
I would love to see, you know, him getting a little bit more work in the past game. I will say this, like if it was ever going to happen, it could be this year just because like who else are they throwing to besides Malik neighbors? Right. I mean, I know we'll talk about, you know, potential tight end sleepers here in a minute with this team, but there could be a situation where even he, those a player that's not normally a target earner. We've seen this at times, even with the guys like AJ Dillon in green Bay, when suddenly everybody's banged up and AJ Dillon's out there getting a 15% target share in a game. We're like, what the heck's happening? Well, <laughs> they don't have anybody else to throw to and the quarterback has to get to their check down quicker. So that could be something that could work out for Singletary. But I will, I, I think you hit the main thing. He's not a guy like we're, we're coming out and touting as being this great player, this, this, this high end elite talent, but where you're getting him in a draft, like I, I can't sit here and argue that it's bad. Like he's the 32nd running back off the board. I don't draft him a lot personally. I don't think he has a lot of upside, but does he have value where he goes in fantasy drafts given the volume? Yes, he does. Number two, RB, potentially Tyron Tracy. Now, I don't want to rule out Eric Gray just yet, but really you Tracy can has. Eric Gray, come on. Okay, okay. But Tracy right now, pick 189, you know, going off the board over underdog fantasy. So certainly not costing you much of anything. Did get some nice word out of minicamp from Art Stapleton saying that Tracy is quote unquote already making a push to be the team's passing down RB. So I think that's where we lose out, Dwayne, potentially with Singletary, is if Tracy can step in from day one. But Man, this is a converted wide receiver. Only 165 collegiate carries to his name. Went round five for a reason. I mean, Dable, now it was with Saquon, but Dable has proved willing, even going back to some of those Bills days, to really just leave his RB1 on the field for, you know, 80% plus more snaps, more than the typical offense. Level of concern with Tracy and if he's someone you're interested in buying late in fantasy drafts. Well, he does have that passing down ability. It's a matter of, like, yes. can they trust him in something more than the two-minute offense? Which, that that's the primary role you want as a pass catcher is the two-minute offense. That's the most valuable one. But again, that might be eight snaps a game, you know, six <laughs> snaps a game, even though we talk about how valuable it is, it matters, but it could also not be a ton. Right. So I think Tracy is going to be the guy that could be the more explosive player. They could try to scheme some things up for him, but I think Singletary's role early in the season, at least is pretty safe, but he's not an explosive player. Whereas Tyrone Tracy, if he proves to be that in camp, I think it's definitely one of the things that we have to monitor through training camp. And I do not mind Tyrone Tracy as a last two round pick. If you're in a league that's drafting, you know, 17, 18 rounds. Again, it mentioned the workhorse kind of nature of this offense. Last year, Buccaneers and Giants led the NFL in terms of having one running back on the field for at least 80% snaps and 59% of their games. So 49ers is the only other offense over 50. So fingers crossed, at least for some of my Singletary best ball squads, that he can get that future role. But Tracy, yes, does profile as that explosive pass-catching talent that if he gets the opportunity, maybe can make the most of it. Finally, for a lot of teams, we start off with the quarterback, but this is not like a lot of teams. It is now or never for Daniel Jones, presumably the week one starter. Now, this is not, hey, guys, I'm a Drew Locke stan. I love the way he plays football because even when it's bad, it's usually a lot of fun to watch. But Daniel Jeremiah, who knows a hell of a lot more about what these NFL teams are thinking than any of us do, does actually believe that Drew Locke actually has a shot to win the starting job. So, look, with Daniel Jones, the He's been never put in a position to overly succeed. I've mentioned the supporting cast rating that I've developed, and basically it's every team's average PFF rushing, receiving, run blocking, and pass blocking grade, everything except passing. And over the last five years, the Giants have ranked 32nd, 21st, 30th, 31st, and 23rd. So horrific offense. They tried to give him a number one wide receiver. And who was that? Kenny Galladay. So obviously that didn't go well. I am hopeful that Malik Neighbors will be far better than any wide receiver he's gotten to play with. The problem I have with getting behind Jones and Fantasyland Dwayne is just his path to success has always been rushing. The artist known as Vanilla Vic. That was how he got the QB8 status in 2022, man. Only Fields, Hurts, Lamar, and Josh Allen were averaging more fantasy points per game than Jones in terms of pure rushing. But my man is coming off an ACL injury, and there's still that neck issue that we've never really gotten a final verdict on. And I don't know about you, man. I'm not a doctor, but I don't love when guys have outstanding neck problems that, again, could rear their ugly head at a moment's notice. So Jones is pretty much free at the end of draft. I will say when I've gotten sniped on certain, you know, late round stacks I've tried to set up and I have neighbors, okay, I've thrown Jones in there, but man, outside of your super flex league where you just need that third guy or again, specifically as a stacking partner for neighbors, I just struggle to get overly excited about Jones because I think he's going to be less than 100% at the thing he's best at. 
you're not drafting Daniel Jones in your fantasy league unless you're playing in a best ball draft with 18 rounds because a lot of teams are drafting three and you have to have at least two. And it's the scenario you said. You've got Malik Neighbors. Maybe you came back around. Maybe you took a, a Adonai Mitchell. You set up that week 17 stack with the Colts. And then you come back around at the end. You grab Wandell Robinson. And then you throw Daniel Jones. Just on the outside case, that <laughs> game goes nuts. Because we, we're not fooling ourselves into thinking Daniel Jones is suddenly going to go nuts for a season. This is a guy that's thrown for 3,000, 2,900, 2,400, and 3,200 yards. Now, he's also missed time every season. But, I mean, I don't know how I can sit here and project this guy for more than 14 or 13 games, given the fact that he's only played 16 one time. Yeah. And honestly, man, it's this whole Giants quarterback room. Like as much as the offensive line hasn't done Jones any favors last year is almost hilarious. When you look at like the worst quarterbacks in the league in terms of not letting pressures be converted to sacks because both Jones and Tommy DeVito, you know, are sitting near the top of that list. So now we're never for Jones. I tend to think it's probably going to be never at this point, but we shall see. Quickly on the coaching staff, it is once again Brian Dable and Mike Kafka running things on offense. And Dwayne, you know, it's kind of been a middle-of-the-road offense in terms of their overall pass play rate. Honestly, I'm less concerned with, you know, what they're going to be doing from an X's and O's standpoint. I'm more concerned about the Jims and Joes at the line of scrimmage. 30th offensive line in terms of PFF rank is at the end of last season. And yes, they, you know, returned two of five starters. They threw a bunch of money at John Runyon and Jermaine Elamuner, you know, in free agency. So maybe things improve, but this, like, especially when Jones was under center last year, man, like this offensive line just cratered the entire offense. I'm not convinced that any level of great scheming by Dable or Kafka is necessarily going to be able to fix that. Yeah, I don't think there's really anything that we have to hit here on the coaching staff. To your point, they just need to get the offensive line better. Yeah. I'll just say quickly on Dable, like, he has proven that he can be a quality coordinator and he yeah. can get probably more out of less versus some other coaches it's just a question of you know can you keep daniel jones upright when total for the giants this year six and a half minus 140 lean on the under plus 115 lean on the over in the division they have the worst odds at plus 1000 so vegas certainly not feeling good about it yes they did add brian burns to the league's rating 26 rank scoring defense but Dwayne, i'm going under six and a half wins here i know it's a low number but my god they haven't even cleared it in six of the last seven years so i know the 17 games helps matters with this but for me this still looks like one of the worst teams in football yeah i agree like I, I think it's a very tough bet to go under that number but if there's a team i'm going to pick it on it is them they've won four nine and six is that right no so sorry seven and then six yeah yeah no four nine and six that's the last three so Six, nine, four, six, four, five, three Jesus. since uh 2016. Where yeah, we had that whole number. What happened 2016? Oh, yeah, the whole boat thing. Sorry, Giants fans. Sorry for bringing that one up. All right, guys, before we move on to some position battles and deep sleepers, I want to give a shout out to our friends over at DraftKings. UFC 303 is bringing the Octagon back to Vegas, and I can say this. You do not want to miss out on any of the action with our partners at DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the UFC. Michael Chandler might be waiting 30 years to get that Conor McGregor fight, but honestly, guys, probably a net positive for the card quality to lose that one when we instead to get the rematch between Alex Pereira and Yuri Prochaska, as well as a low, not a low-key, a high-key banger between Brian Ortega and Diego Lopez there in the co-main event. So I cannot wait for this one again. Fire matchups all set to take place in the octagon. And then guess what? If you're new to DraftKings, we have a great deal for you. Listen up. New customers who bet just $5 will get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Download a DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use our code FANTASYLIFE. The crown is yours. Dwayne mentioned the position battle going on. Just not so sure it's going to be overly fancy relevant at the end of the day because of many of the reasons we brought up with this passing game. That said, behind Malik Neighbors, there's Jalen Hyatt, there's Darius Slayton, and there is Juan Dale Robinson vying for that wide receiver two job. So with our projections, I mean, it's not exactly standing out as one of the top passing games, and for good reason. I mean, this is the offense that has produced the fifth fewest passing yards and touchdowns over these past two seasons. So personally, I tend to lean Darius Slayton and when I've needed a Giants you know bring back in the last round I've gone to Slayton he just to me seems like the most prototypical X in this offense I see you know neighbors taking most of Hyatt's deep targets and conveniently Wandale's short targets but even then man I can say these nice things about Slayton and he's probably not ranked inside my top 80 wide receivers 
Yeah, Slayton's this guy that's just really he's like a wide receiver six. And that that just tells you the state of the of the Giants offense. Yeah. This dude keeps on getting out there. Uh he's pretty good against man coverage last year, but just yeah, overall, not much. I I prefer Wandell Robinson personally because last year he was still coming off of the ACL injury. He got better as sure. the season went. And you talked about it, terrible offensive line. And if that doesn't improve, you're going to have to get some of the quick hitting things out of there. Uh, we don't know, how, know what the run game is going to look like, so I could see Wandell being more of an extension of the run game. I'm with you. Neighbors the, is the primary target. He's the guy we want. But if I am tacking on someone later, it has typically been Wandell Robinson. He's got more draft capital. He's a guy that they took more recently. Whereas Darius Slayton, yeah, they gave him his money, but he's already complaining, saying he wants more money. I'm like, dude, like you're <laughs> already getting overpaid. Like, yes, you... I know what happens. Like you're playing for the Giants. You're like, everybody else here sucks. Like, so I should be getting more money. <laughs> um, but I just don't think like, you know, he has, he should be a backup wide receiver. He should not be a starting wide receiver in the NFL. Jalen Hyatt intrigues me, but not enough that I'm willing to click on his name. Cause for all I know, he won't play, you know, he comes from that really gimmicky offense at Tennessee, but he does have that vertical field stretching ability. Unfortunately, as the Giants always seem to do, Ian, everyone's playing slot. <laughs> Wando <laughs> Robinson's playing slot. Jalen Hyatt's playing slot. They want to move Malik Neighbors around in the slot. Theo Johnson, their tight end, he's going to play from the slot. Giants, you got to get some guys that can play on the outside. Come on, man. <laughs> and Malik Neighbors, don't get me wrong, guys. Malik Neighbors can play outside. Oh, he yeah. can play anywhere. So we're not saying that, but it's like this whole other cast of characters. It's like they're all slot wide Isaiah McKenzie, Gunnar Oswenski is there. I mean, See, it really like, is what ridiculous. is the deal? <laughs> they, they I got, don't understand this fascination. Brian Dable started this in <laughs> Buffalo when he had McKenzie and Cole Beasley. I can't remember. He had Ryan Switzer, I think, there at some point. We're forgetting so, someone, know. Dwayne. Allen Robinson back for another oh go God, round. Let's get him. Uh, let's get him going in the slot. So I'm with you. And to be fair to Darius Slayton, he has made the most out of his opportunities in a bad offense. Four seasons with over 700 yards. Yards per target is not the best and most predictive stat. There are better ones out there. But with that said, one of only 10 players to average at least 10 yards per target over these past two years. So it is funny to think about, you know, Slayton just easily working as the best wide receiver in Giants camp for the past half decade. And he's like, yeah, I'm the best guy out here. Why shouldn't I be making a bit more? He's not wrong. <laughs> not wrong. Just maybe, uh, you know, needs to get some eyes on some other uh, units around. The league. But great Twitter presence. Do not, you know, mistake this for Darius Slayton slander. Free Darius Slayton. How about that one, uh, Giants fan? There you go. Only put, other put that uh, all on me. Yeah, there we go. Only other uh, position to really talk about here, Dwayne, is the tight end room because again, Darren Waller chose to retire after flirting with the idea for freaking months on end. I mean, I know Jordan Renan said that the Giants were always working under the assumption that you know Waller was not going to be back there. But my God, dude, make up your mind after a while. But he did, and hey. Darren Waller, you know, awesome comeback story in his life, you know, and end up having a pretty damn, you know, good three-run stretch there, especially with the Raiders. So enjoy retirement and all that. But Theo Johnson, Dwayne, rookie, pretty freaking athletic, ninth in RAS score among over 1,100 tight ends. If you're into that thing, 6'6", 259 pounds, 4'5", 740. There's a lot to like here, but the problem is, like we see with a lot of rookie and even just young tight ends in general, sometimes tough for them to, you know, go ahead and get to that magical 70% out that you always talk about in your critically acclaimed utilization report yeah it's just tough for late round rookie tight ends to really come in and do anything now having said that like it's wide open it's him and daniel bellinger battling for this spot so this is one for the camp battle that i think we're going to want to keep an eye on this will be one of the stories here because we have mentioned it if somehow theo johnson ends up or daniel bellinger for that matter end up that we know they're the starting tight end and it's not going to be a super duper rotation, which will be hard to know, honestly, until the season starts. But if if we really are getting a lot of information pushing us in that direction, then maybe we can talk about one of them being a low end mid range tight end too. you know, yeah. with potential every year. We have somebody that we didn't expect climb into that low end tight end one range. So maybe they get a chance to be in that conversation as the summer goes on. But right now it's really hard. And Theo Johnson. Very athletic, and that does matter more for tight ends than any other position. But he was not a high-end target earner at Penn State. Like, this guy did not earn targets, like, hardly at all. So we do have some examples of guys like that eventually getting it in the NFL, but it wasn't right away in their first year. Would have been nice to see the guy, you know, get to 350 yards in a season. I'm not saying that's the end-all, be-all number or anything, but yeah. These Penn just, State guys, man, they just go to the combine and blow it up and get drafted. Dude. Like, I'm not saying that we haven't had some good Penn State players, but, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. Hey, 
do not ask me for my Mike Jasicki exposure, Twain. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> uh, all I'm saying over there. But yes, again, history. If you just, I know Sam Laporta is fresh in everyone's mind, but if you spent the last, you know, decade just fading rookie tight ends in general, you'd probably be doing just fine. We had 2017 Evan Ingram go ahead and post top 12 numbers. Kyle Pitts got there, believe it or not, back in 2021. And of course, Sam Laporta last year. But that's it over the past decade of action. And those guys, you know, were going in the NFL draft round one, round one, and round two. Obviously, the was not anything more than a day three guy. So most likely answer to if you want to roster Theo or Daniel Bellinger or Jack Stoll or Chris Manhurts, probably just a no for the Giants. So Manhurts. That's a great, that's a great name for a tight end. I have just a great name. name. Chris <laughs> Manhurts. All man over there. Go get your blocks done. But yeah, I want to invite you guys. Mentioned them earlier, but Jordan Renan is a fantastic uh, Twitter follower if you are trying to get some more Giants intel. Also, Charlotte C R L L is a good one. And then as always at 30 to beat writers and at coach speak index thank you for everything you guys do so Dwayne, going to close it out as we always do here with a tv slash movie character that we would equate the giants to i'm going to start off with post michael scott bosses from the office they tried a lot of different guys we had a funny you know a couple funny laughs of will ferrell in there but at the end of the day daniel jones and sadly even my guy drew lock they just can't measure up to the goat michael scott and just like they cannot measure up to eli manning even if the show otherwise might look the same i mean truly eli manning and daniel jones they look the same but guess what we are not getting the same results so brief good time or two we all remember that you know playoff victory in minnesota again there were a couple good episodes as well but generally just haven't been very good for several years at this point and yeah overall just a mess so you got one here Dwayne I guess give me the walking dead like and just give me like the random zombies that we don't notice like you eventually get to the point in that show where like they have to make the zombie stuff so gruesome just for you to even notice it because it's just a backdrop right for all the other characters I kind of feel like the Giants are stuck in that mode I, I don't want to piss off all the Giants fans because like look I get it I was there before with the Cowboys so I've been it, it, that may even be worse having to watch the Cowboys get killed but like at least they get to the playoffs but look I do think that you have a good coach, but they got to get the quarterback thing figured out, Ian. So I think they're still going to have to figure out quarterback. Maybe the offensive line can be just good enough so that maybe Daniel Jones himself is not a zombie, you know, after like two games. So we'll see how it works out. But yeah, I would go with these zombies that we don't notice on The Walking Dead. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up another edition of the Fantasy Live podcast. We are ripping through all 32 teams, getting you ready there for the season. We'll have plenty of streams and other good information for you in the meantime. But yeah, always a great day to be great over here with Team Fantasy Life. So you guys can check out my full New York Giants team preview column for free over at fantasylife.com. Dwayne's projections and our consensus team rankings all for free. Gotta love that. Links are in the description. Subscribe and follow Fantasy Life on YouTube as we get you ready for draft season. If you don't mind, then yeah. Otherwise, have a great day. So for Dwayne, for producer Matt, I'm Ian. Thanks again for tuning into the Fantasy Life podcast. And until next time, take care, everybody.